Hello, welcome and a very good evening. Today we have a hefty piece of hardware. It's the Roland Soundbrush 55. It looks similar to the Sound Canvas 55, which we already seen on this channel. And it's, yeah, it's basically from the same family. It's a MIDI device. It's a MIDI file player and recorder. Uh, the Sound Canvas is a MIDI module that contains a synthesizer, um, wavetable synthesizer basically, and is very popular with um, retro games because it was very well supported under DOS and you can listen to lots of nice music in different games. But what if you don't want to use a PC to listen to those game music files? Well, this comes in very handy. I mean, it's of course a very weird way to listen to music. Um, but you can put a disc in here, a floppy disk, put some MIDI files on there, attach the whole thing to the sound canvas, and you have basically a music system with wavetable synthesis without the need of any PC. And yeah, that's actually pretty cool. And I got this, um, I think on eBay or on the classifieds for only a few euros because these are not very popular because they have not that much application. I mean, as a musician, you could record your performance on there and then play it back later or edit it on your PC. But usually you would use your PC anyway for recording. So I think this was a bit of a weird thing to have or to use. But still, I like the design because it looks so much like the SC55. And yeah, so let's go over to the desk and have a closer look. All right, so let's have a look, a closer look at the device. And I have, they are pretty hefty. I have both devices here, the Sound Canvas 55 Mark I and the Sound Brush SB55. And they do look like brothers, don't they? Or like siblings. The sound canvas obviously has the big LCD display, whereas the sound brush will have the floppy drive. Both have two auxiliary MIDI input ports and on the right side they have all the controls. The sound brush, of course, for playing and recording and skipping tracks and stuff like that. And the Soundbrush only has this little three um, digit seven segment display. And I should clean probably the display a bit, but I think that's fine. And uh, the power button, it feels a little bit smushed in. This one here feels much better. I think mm, this might have worn out a bit because of course this will be one of the buttons that you press all the time. So, um, worthy of notice, both devices, I think, have a lithium battery inside. We already removed the one in the sound canvas because for games I really don't need the, to store the settings when the power is off. And I will link to um, the video where I did that up here. And yeah, the sound brush, I think, should have one as well. So we need to check if the battery is in there and if it's leaking we should definitely remove it and uh, it's probably a good idea to remove it anyway because I don't think I need the settings on here either otherwise I can replace it with a fresh one that's no problem plus we should check the read write heads in here and clean it a little bit with alcohol and a q-tip uh, looking on the back of the devices, sorry for hitting it so hard, they look almost indistinguishable. Ugh. Apart one from one thing. So we have the usual MIDI in, out and through. And the sound canvas obviously has the RCA output jacks for audio, but also an input jack for Daisy chaining, for example, I daisy chain my Roland MT32 into this one so I can have both devices um, play at the same time without needing an extra port on the mixer or stuff like that. Yeah, and um, the 
Soundbrush has a remote control input for playing and stopping, which I probably will never use. Both use the same center negative 9 volt uh, power supply. No, not exactly. Um, the Soundbrush actually uses 900 milliamps, whereas the Sound Canvas only needs 500 milliamps. I think I have the original power supply with the Soundbrush, but otherwise I also have a couple of 1 amp 9 volt power supplies. So next up will be to open the case and it's probably as easy as removing the screw here. Not sure if we need anything more. So let's get to that. The sound canvas will be put to the side for the minute. Then we take a screwdriver with a bit that might fit. Let's see. Good. Oh, okay. We have more screws on the sides. Yep, and we're in. And there is a RF shield, I guess. I haven't seen that in the... I haven't seen that in the sound canvas. Screws in here are very tight. I think this has never been opened up and it's looking pretty pretty clean. I think back here is probably the I.O. board. I see a few ICs over there, a big capacitor, probably for buffering the power supply, I don't know. Um, maybe a little inductor, not sure what that is. Hmm, okay, well, Let's compare the screws, I think, yeah, they look, I think, all the same. So that's simplifying things, but they definitely feel like they have never been taken out. Maybe they even have some Loctite on them. Okay. Oh boy, this is not only the shield, but it's the whole PCB. Oh goodness. Okay, there is no battery in here, from what I can tell. But lots of cables to be unplugged. Let me take a couple of pictures and then I'll get back. Okay, disassembled it is, and there are a few surprises in this machine. And we will take a look at the case and the uh, backboard and the floppy drive in a second. But first of all, this is the main board. And it was mounted upside down, and this is the front of the case, and this is the rear. And at the rear you can already see the connector for the floppy drive. And right next to this is a Hitachi chip, which is the floppy drive controller. It's a HD632, uh, 6.5. And yeah, this is the floppy drive controller. Then down here we have another chip, which is the NEC V25. This is the microcontroller version of the V20, which is actually a an 8086 compatible CPU. So this thing could in theory probably run some form of DOS if you had all the other hardware, but it's definitely an x86 compatible processor. I'm not sure if they use it in the x86 compatible fashion. I think it's also compatible to the 8080, I think, maybe. Um, yeah, probably clocked at 8 megahertz. At least it says dash 8, so that's what I would assume, which would probably be plenty enough for this device. Then over here we have the ROM, um, supposedly version 1.0.3 maybe. I have to check if there's a newer one. Um, seems to be an erasable, UV erasable prom. I could probably dump it, but I guess there are already dumps floating around. I haven't checked that yet. Then over here we have the RAM, I think. Um, at least it's a 32 kilobyte pseudo-static RAM 
pseudo static because I think it's just a DRAM chip that has auto refresh. Um, at least according to the data sheet. I know here is an electrically erasable 2 kilobyte PROM, which is probably why I don't find any batteries on here, because settings can, I guess, be written to this thing here, which doesn't need any battery backup, which is a nice thing. Um, I think I read in the instruction manual that this thing has a lithium battery, but maybe that was for a previous version, or I don't know. Um, if there was anything like that. And down here we have all the circuitry for the buttons and the LED drivers. Um, this one over here seems to be a transistor array, probably for switching the... Uh, or maybe it's for the button reading, I don't know. No idea here. Because over here is also a high voltage uh, output driver, an octal high voltage output driver, which might be used for driving the LEDs. Not sure. I couldn't find a data sheet for this chip here. Could also be related to that. But this is definitely all the logic doing the uh, front panel stuff. Yeah, so that's basically it. So we have a microcontroller with a floppy drive controller attached to it bunch of glue logic chips which is fine and then the RAM and the ROM up here in the corner and this is the connector to the back of the board so this is probably a power supply plus the MIDI uh, signals which um, don't need that many wires I guess and um, there's one more thing here a little zip uh, package it's also an IC it's a current sensing I see, um, which probably also protects against polarity mistakes, I hope. <laughs> um, but that's for the power supply, I would guess. And this probably just uh, detects if there's the 9 volt with the right polarity and then powers on the rest of the system without everything getting fried. Yeah, so it's um, definitely of high, typically high roll in quality, I say. Um, yeah, and that's that. Let's have another look. Let's zoom out a bit at the floppy drive. So if you took a look at this, it's a double density floppy drive by Chinon. It's probably the same. That's in for a very similar one. That's in my Amiga 500 actually. But of course this won't read Amiga floppies. This will read only fat formatted floppies. And um, we might just take it out by removing those screws and uh, give it a bit of a clean. I think it probably isn't that dirty, um, but it's probably a good idea to have a look. And uh, I mean, this device is almost 30 years old, but it looks almost like new. Yeah, here is the device. It seems to be a slightly different version from what I have in my Amiga. It seems to have this interesting faceplate and it looks to be pretty hard to get into that and I probably won't do it um, because it's very well sealed. I don't think there will be a lot of dirt. The dirt will be probably from the floppies themselves and you can probably still get a hold of a cleaning disc or something. I don't want to destroy this. I don't want to fix anything that isn't broken. So um, there don't appear to be any bells here. Maybe this is uh, the, the small floppies are all direct drive. I don't know. Not not a big clue there. But as I said, since it appears to be working and doesn't seem to be very well, um, yeah, misbehaving. I will just leave it as is because I can probably only destroy it. So um, apart from that, I think we had a look inside and um, there's not much to do here. We can have one more look on the uh, back plate here, but uh, not much else to see here either. There's a couple of ICs. I guess there must be some optocoupler in there, which is I think mandatory for for MIDI devices, um, 
maybe one of those chips but actually yeah this the cap looks good i don't want to replace it either if it doesn't make any trouble it doesn't appear to be leaking it's not bulging so i assume that it's fine the device powers on anyway and um, i think we just yeah here we have a look at the front pcbs for the display and the power button so the only thing that's a bit mushy is the power button but it's not too bad so i don't want to risk breaking anything here either overall it seems to be in very good shape it's extremely clean which is also why i refrain from doing any more stuff on this but it's interesting to have a look inside so i'll quickly assemble it again and then we will plug it into the sound canvas power it on with some midi files on there and we will also try and pipe stuff into the mt32 because that would be nice to have a standalone playback machine that can play mt32 tunes um if they work or not i don't know i'm not sure if any of the rips um store on the proprietary sysx commands to define the custom instruments etc but yeah we will see so let me quickly put this together again and see if we hopefully didn't break anything Okay, how do we set this thing up? We are looking at the back of the devices, on the bottom again the sound canvas, on the top the sound brush, and it's actually pretty simple. So um, we take a standard MIDI cable, just like this, and plug it into the MIDI out of the, actually no, on the MIDI out of the sound brush, and into the MIDI in for the sound canvas. And that's more or less it. Then you of course need the power supplies. This is the one for the sound canvas, the replacement one. This is the original barrel jack of the sound brush. And we are ready to go. I will turn this around. I will plug in some leads to the RCA so we can record the sound and you can actually hear something and we will put in a floppy disk with midi files one word about the floppy disks that you have to use with the soundbrush 55 they are three and a half inch disks uh, as usual but they have to be double density this one and you can make it out by the hd here and by the extra hole up here is a high density disk and um, the sound canvas will read those if they are formatted in the DD, double density format, 720K. But um, most likely your PC's floppy drive won't write them correctly. Um, I had to tape over the hole up here to make it a double density floppy. Then I could format it on the 486. And also note that um, my USB floppy drive that I use on the Mac to transfer data between both machines doesn't even want to read the DD disks, read or write. So you probably need really an old PC which can read and write double density disks. And it would be best if you also had double density disks, but they are much more uncommon, at least. Uh, these one are ones I bought new or new old stock and those are mostly high density. So keep that in mind. Um, it might be a bit tricky to get data on there. You could of course put a GoTag floppy emulator into that machine, but I think that's not the idea. I think we want to definitely listen to the music from a floppy drive because that's way more cooler and uh, I think the GoTag doesn't fit very well behind those 
uh, black things on the front. So go with a floppy drive. Having the sound canvas play the stuff is all good and fine, but I also want to use my Roland MT32. However, the games usually load up custom patches onto this device via so-called MIDI SysX events. So I put a floppy disk in here that contains these SysX events, however I get a checksum error message and I think not all of the things are actually correctly uploaded. So um, I need to experiment more with this. Here is now the Monkey Island introduction again. However, as you will note, it's slightly wrong sounding. So that's it for the sound brush. What do I think about this device? I think it's a very nice addition to my MIDI stack, but I think you probably don't really need the device. It would be cool, for example, to put it right next to your stereo system and plug it in there so you can play MIDI files even when not uh, powering up any computer. But on the other hand, most of the time I want to listen to the music in the game and not while doing some other stuff. So I probably won't be using it that much. That being said, it's still a very cool device and it might also be useful to capture MIDI files from games because um, you can basically just record to the floppy disk 
And uh, the good thing is it also records all the SysX events, which are important for Monkey Island 2. And you have seen that it didn't quite work with the um, downloadable files that I had um, found on the internet. So maybe I might want to try and record my own version of, for example, the Monkey Island soundtrack or stuff like Space Quest 3, all the different games that use MT32 exclusive system messages. So yeah, I think that's nice. But that's it for today. Um, please share, like and subscribe as usual. That helps greatly. And if you want to help even more, you can join me over on Patreon or Ko-fi or PayPal. But if you don't, that's also fine. Make sure to leave a comment, uh, share your experiences with MIDI files and uh, MIDI machines and all the nice little stuff. And come back next time, I hope. So, good evening. <laughs>